face that presents a screaming skull. I have often heard it scream. No, I am not nervous. I am not imaginative. I have never believed in ghosts, lest the thing is one. However, it, it, whatever it is, it hates me almost as much as I hate it. It Luke Pratt, it screams at me. If I were you, I would never tell ugly stories about the ingenious ways of killing people. You never can tell what someone on the, at the table may be tired of his, his or nearest or dearest. I've always blamed myself for Mrs. Pratt's death. I suppose I was responsible for it, a way, though heaven knows, I never wished anything but long life and happiness. If I had told that story, she might still be alive yet. That is why the thing screams at me, I fancy. She is a good little woman, with a sweet temper, all things considered, a nice little, a nice gentle little voice. I remember hearing her shriek once when she thought her little boy was killed by a pistol and went off though everyone was sure it was not loaded. It was the same scream, exactly the same, with a sort of rising quaver at the end. Do you know what I mean? Unmistakable. The truth is, I realised that the doctor and his wife were not on good terms. He used to bicker a little bit now and then when I was here. I often noticed that Mrs. Little Miss Pratt got very red and bit her lip hard to keep her temper, but Luke grew pale and said the most offensive things. He thought when he was in the nursery, I remember after at school, he was my cousin, you know, is how I came by his house after he died and why Charlie was killed in South Africa. There was no relations left. Yes, it was pretty little property. Just the sort of thing for an old sailor like me who had taken to the gardening. Once one always remembers one's mistakes which while well, vividly and one's cleverest things doesn't one? I often notice it I done it when the Pratts were uh, one night I told them a story that Arthur has made so much the difference it was a wet night in November the sea was moaning hush if you don't speak you don't you know you will hear it now Do, did you hear the tide? Don't be sound, isn't it? Sometimes about this time of a year. Hello, there it is. Don't be frightened, man. It won't eat you. It's only a noise, after all. But I'm glad you heard it, because there's always people who think it's a wind or my imagination or something. You didn't hear it again tonight, I fancy. They didn't often... Doesn't often come more than once. Yes, that's right. Put another stick in the fire. A little more stuff into the mi- mixture you're so fond of. Do you remember old Bradley Lot, the carpenter? The German ship you picked up when the Gruffer went to the bottom? We have to hove to do in howling gale one night. As snug as you please, with no land for f- within 500 miles. Ship coming up and felling as rough as regular a clockwork. Biddy to bore bibbles, the shore night prefers. Old Balex sang out as we went off his quarters with a cell maker. I often think of that, for that I am sure you've good and all. Yes, it was a night like this. I was home to the spell, waiting to tell Olympia about out on her first trip. It was a vox voice she broke the record, you remember. Why at that day that but that date it. Ninety-two was a year, early in November. The water of ever was dirty. Pratt was out of temper. The weather was bad, very bad indeed. It doesn't improve matters and the cold, which made it worse. A poor little lad was unhurry and happy about it. She's making a Welsh rabbit on the table, counteract. A raw ta- turnips and half-boiled mutton. Pratt often must have had a hard day, perhaps. Lost patience. Oh, Vince, he was, was in a nasty temper. Wife is trying to poison me, you see, he said. She seemed you one day. I'm sure she'll hurt. I may believe her to laugh. I said Mrs. Pratt was much too clever to get rid of her husband. So it's a simple way. They were going to tell him about the Japanese tricks that were spun glass and chopped tooth hair and the like. Pratt was a doctor and knew a lot more than I did about such things. But he only put me in my nettle. I told the story about a woman in Ireland who had did for three hundred years before. Any one suspected foul play. Do you do you never hear that tale? Fourth husband managed to keep awake and caught her, and she was hung. 
How did she do it? She drugged them and poured metal lead into their ears, while a little hot foam funnel when they were asleep. No, that's the wind whistling. It backing up to the southward again. I can tell you that my own sound. Besides, the other thing doesn't often come more than once in the evening than in this time of year. When it happened, yes, it was in November. Poor Mrs. Pratt died suddenly in a bed. Not long after I dined here, I can't fix a date because I got news in New York. My steamer, that... Followed Olympia. When I took her to the first trip, you had a Lufferick the dies the same year. Yes, I remember. What a pair of old buffers we're going to be. You and I, nearly fifty years since we were apprentices together on the Catholic. Well, I still will never forget old Ballot. Bidia de Bure, Bibbles de Shore, babies. Aha! Take a little more of the water in the same Hassacat. I found a cellar at the house, came to me. The same I bought Luke from Amsterdam five and twenty years ago. He never touched a drop of it. Perhaps he's sorry. Now, poor fellow. Why now did leave off? I told you that Mrs. Pratt died suddenly. Yes, Luke must have been lonely here. But after she died, I f- should think I c- could see him now and then. He looked worn and nervous and told me his practice was growing too heavy for him. Though he wouldn't take an assistant to any account, years went by his son was killed in South Africa. After he began to be queer, there's something about him like, not like other people, because uh, he kept his senses of his profession to the end of no complaint of having made mistakes in cases, anything of the sort, but he had a look about him. Luke was a red-handed man with a pale face, and he was young. He was very stout. In middle age, he turned to grey granny, and his son grew, died. He grew thinner and thinner, till his head looked like a skull with parchment stretched out. It's very tight. His eyes had a sort of glare in them that was very disagreeable to look at. He had an old dog that poor Mr. Pratt had found of fond of them, used to follow her everywhere. He was a bulldog and the sweetest tempered beast you ever saw. Though he was very he had a way of hitching his upper lip behind one of his fangs and frightened strangers a good deal. Sometimes on evening Pratt and Bumble, that was the name dog's name, seems to sit and look at each other. Long time thinking about old times. I suppose that's when Luke used to sit in that chair and got like they got. You always had a place. That was the doctor's where I am sitting. Bumble used to climb up to the footstool. He's old and fat by the time I could not jump much. His teeth were already shaky. He would not look steadily woke and Luke would look steadily at the dog. His face glowing more and more like a skull and two little coals for eyes. After that five minutes or so though it would have been less old Bumble would suddenly begin to shake all over all of a sudden he would let out an awful howl as if he was being shot and tumbled out of the easy chair trod away and may hid himself under the cup sideboard and lay there making odd noises Considering Pat Pratt's looks at those in those last months, things not surprising you. Know, I'm not nervous or imaginative, but I can't quite believe he might have sent a presented woman into hysterics. His head looked so much as skull and parchment. At last, I came down one day before Christmas. My ship was in dock. I had three weeks off. Bumble's not about, I said casually. I suppose the old dog was dead. Yes, Pratt answered. I thought there was something odd in his tone. Even before he went on after the little falls, I killed him, I said presently. I could not stand it any longer. I asked what it was that Luke could not stand, though I guessed well enough. He had a way of sitting in a chair and glaring at me, and then howling, Luke shivered a little. He had not suffered at all, poor Bumble. He went on to the hurry, and he think, thought he might imaginative. Imagine he had to be cruel. I had put Dobertonane into his drink to make him sleep soundly, and I chloroformed him gradually, so he did not have to suffocate even if he was dreaming. He had been quite quieter since then. I wondered what he meant, for the words slipped out as if he had not helped saying them. I understand since he went, he did not hear the noise so more often that the dog was out. The way, perhaps he thought that at first he was old Bumble, the yard howling in the moon. That was not the kind of noise it is. Besides, I know what it is. If Luke doesn't, not, doesn't, it's only a noise after all. A noise. 
Never hurt anyone yet, but he's much more magic than I am. No doubt there really is something about this place I don't understand, but I don't understand a thing. When I don't understand a thing, I call it phenomenon. I don't take it for granted, and then it's going to kill me. As he did, he did. I don't understand everything by odd long odds. Do you? Or does it any man who's went to spin the sea? We used to talk of trying to ways, for instance, and we could not account for them. Yet we account for them by calling them submarine earthquakes. He marched off into fifty theories. Any one which might make earthquakes quite comprehensible, if we only knew where they were. I fell in with one of the other one, them once. His instinct flew straight up to the table against a ceiling to my cabin. The yeah, same thing happened to Captain Leakey. I dare say you read about it in his wrinkles. Very good. It's a good... This sort of thing took place ashore. This rumour, for instance, a nervous person would talk about spirits and levitation. Fifty things that mean nothing. Instead of most quietly setting it down phenomenon. Being explained yet, a view on that voice, you see. Besides, it's not, there was, what is it to prove that Luke killed his far wife? I could not even suggest such a thing for any one but you. After all, you nothing but the coincidence that poor little Mrs. Pratt died suddenly in a bed a few days after I had the story. Sorry, 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 dinner. She was the only person who had ever died like that. Like, Luke got the doctor over the next parish and they agreed that she had died of something in the manner of her heart. Why not? It's common enough. Of course, that wire was a ladle. I never told anyone about that. It made me start. I found it in the cupboard in the bedroom. I knew too a little tin, little iron ladle. had not been in the fire once. Once or twice, the same lead in what men melted and struck the bottom of the bowl, all grey and hard and dross on it, but that proves nothing. A country doctor is generally a handyman who doesn't know anything for himself. Luke, say it may, a dozen reasons for melting a little lead in his needle. He is fond of sea fishing, for instance, and may have cast the sinker for the night line. Perhaps it was a weight of the whole clock or something like that. All the same, when I found it, rather a queer sensation, because it looked so much like a thing I described when I told him the story. Do you understand? It affected me pleasantly. I threw it away in the bottom of the sea, a marvel of spirit, and it would be jolly well rusted beyond recognizing raising it, even if it had been ever washed up to the tide. You see, Luke must have brought in the village years ago. A man sells, you see, late, such ladies, I suppose. He used in cooking. Any case, there was no reason for the oh, because of that, right? To find such a thing lying about with lead in it. I wonder what the, what it was. I perhaps talked to the maid who heard me tell the story at dinner. For that girl married my plumber's son in the village. And now he remember the whole thing. You understand me, don't you? Now that Luke Pratt is dead and gone and raised, but buried beneath your wife is with the honest man's tombstone on his head, I should not care to stir up anything that would hurt his memory. They are both dead and their son are too. A trouble thought about Luke's death it was. How he found dead on the beach one morning. There was a court of the request. It marks his throat, but he had not been robbed. The verdict was that he had come to his end by the hands or teeth of some person or animal unknown. For half the jury thought he might have been a big dog and thrown him down and gripped his windpipe for the skin of his throat and not broken. But then you one knew what time he'd gone out or where he'd been. He found him lying on the back before the high water mark an old cobbled vine box he belonged to his wife under his hand open a lid had fallen off he seemed to have been carrying home its gold box doctors are fun of collecting such things he rolled out and lay but near his head a markedly fine skull rather small beautifully shaped very white with perfect teeth then that is to say the upper jaw was perfect but no lower one at all when I first saw it yes I found it here when I came, you see, very white and polished, like a thing meant to be under a glass case. People did not know where it came from, nor what it was to do with it. But they put it back in the cupboard box and set it on the shelf of the cupboard. The best bedroom, of course, they showed it to me while I took possession. 
I take him bound to the beach too to be shown the place where Luke was found. The old fisherman explained and how, how he's lying, a skull beside him. The only point he could not explain was why the skull was rolled up and lowered, sloping sand towards Luke's head, instead of rolling downward on his feet. It did not seem odd to him at the time. I often thought of it since, for the palace is rather steep. Place is rather steep. I take you there tomorrow if you like. I may I made a sort of clay of stones there afterwards. When he fell down and thrown down, whatever happened, a band box struck the sand and the lid came off. A thing came out and ought to have rolled down. It didn't. He closed his head, almost touching it, and turned the face towards it. I say it didn't strike as odd when the man told me. I could not think thinking about the afterwards again and again. So I saw a picture of it, it all. When I opened my eyes, I began to ask myself why the plaguey thing had rolled up instead of down. Why it stopped near Luke's head instead of anything think where else a yard away for instance you naturally want to know what conclusion of each don't you none of all at all not a, none at all it's playing playing and rolling the events by some ways but something else is all in my head after a time that made me feel downright uncomfortable no i don't mean to do don't mean there's anything supernatural there may be ghosts or there may not be if they are, I'm not inclined to believe that it can hurt a living person except by frightening them. And for my part, I'd rather f- face any shape of a ghost and a frog and a canal than it, when it's crowded. No, that bothered me was a foolish idea. That's all. I cannot tell how it began, nor what made it grow to it turned to sanctity. I think about Luke's poor wife one evening of my pipe and dull book. It occurred to me that the skull might possibly be hers. I never got rid of the thought since. You tell me there's no sense in it. No doubt that Mrs. Prout was buried or, or, like a Christian, lying in the churchyard, where she put her perfectly monstrous to suppose her husband kept a skull in an old hand box in his bedroom. All the same, in the face of reason and the common sense, probability, convinced he did. Doctor did all sorts of queer things that made men like you and me feel creepy. And those are just things that didn't seem probable, not logical, not sensible to us. And then, don't you see, it really was a skull. Poor woman. The only way of counting for his having it his ability to kill her. It did. It, in that way, as a woman killed her husband. In a story that it was, she was afraid it might be an examination, examination some day would betray him. You see, I told you too, I believe it happened some 50 or 60 years ago. They dug up the three skulls, you know, a small lump of lead rattling about in each one. And that, were, that was what hanged the woman. Luke remembered that, I'm sure. I don't want to know what he did, what he thought of it. My taste never ran in the direction of horrors. I don't fancy you care what I've either done, do you? No, if you did, you might supply what he's like wanting to the story. You might have been rather grim, huh? I wish I did not see the whole thing so distinctly, just as everything... I don't know what might have happened. It might be night before she was buried. I saw the coffin had been shut when the servant was as good as asleep. I would bet anything you got out. We put something under the sheet in its place. To fill up what look at it. Do you suppose he put it there? Under the sheet? I don't want to take me up what I'm saying. For as I tell you, I don't want to know what happened. And I hate to think what about horrors. And then I described the whole thing to you as I had seen it. I'm quite sure it was her work bag that we put there. I remember the bell very well, as she always used it on the evening when she made a brownish push. And it was stuffed full. It was about a size, you understand? Yes, sir, I am at it again. You look, may look off at me, but don't, you don't live here alone. Well, it's done. And you didn't tell Luke. The story about the melted lead. I'm not nervous, I tell you. I sometimes begin to feel and understand why some people are. I dwell on all this when I'm alone and dream of it. Then the thing screams. Well, frankly, I don't fit like noise any more than you do. Why should I should be used to it by this time? I ought not to be nervous. I sailed a haunted ship. There was a man atop with two thirds of the crew died in the West Coast fever. Inside of ten days, we were after we anchored. It's all right then and afterwards. I have been to some ugly sights too, just as you have the rest of us. 
but nothing ever struck my head in the way this does. You see, I'm tired of getting rid of the thing, but it doesn't, doesn't, but doesn't like that. It wants to be where, here in a place. Mrs. Pratt's band box in the cupboard. Best bedroom. It's not happy anywhere else. How do I know that? Because it try, I tried it. You don't suppose I haven't tried it, do you? As long as there is any screams now and then, generally in this time of year. I put it on out of the house. It goes on all night. No servant will stay here 24 hours. As if i am been often been left alone. A red blight to shift for myself for a fortnight at one a time. No one from the village ever passed a night on the roof now. As selling the place or letting it that's out of the question. The old woman say there's a day here I shall come to bear and bear end myself very all long. I'm afraid of that. You smile with me your idea that any one could take such nonsense seriously. Not quite right. It's utterly blatant nonsense. I agree with you. Don't you expect it's very only a noise after all? When he started to look round, he expected to see a ghost standing behind your chair. I may be wrong, but you but a skull. I like to think I am. But I can I but where and I can. I may be just a fine specimen. Where Luke got something long ago that rattles out about inside. You'd think it may be nothing but a pebble, or a bit of burial clay, or inside anything. Skulls that have, have laid long in the ground generally have something inside them that rattles, don't they? Do you ever tire to get out, whatever it is? I'm afraid you might be led, don't you see? It is, if it is. I won't want to know the fact that I'd rather know, be, not be sure. It really is lead. I killed her as quite as much as I had done to do myself. Anyway, buddy, must I see that? I should think, as long as I don't know, know for certain, a consideration of saying it's all utterly ridiculous nonsense that Mrs. Pratt died a natural death and that beautiful skull belonged to Luke when he was a student in London. But if I was quite sure, I believe I should leave the house. Indeed, I do. Most day certainly as it is i've given up everything given up trying to sleep in the best bedroom the cupboard is you ask me why i don't throw it in the pond yes please don't call it confounded bear bu- bu- it doesn't like being called names there lord what a shriek i told you you're quite pale man fill your pipe and draw your chair nearer to the fire i'll take have a take some drink of Hoddle Ollens. Never hurt anybody, yet I've seen a Dutchman drive a drink half a jug. I had a man kept in the morning, but turning a hair, don't quite, but don't like much by myself, because it doesn't agree with my rheumatism. You're not rheumatic, it won't damage you. Besides, it was very damp outside. The wind is howling again, and it's soon to be southwest. Do you hear the windows rattle? The tide must be turned too by the moaning. We should not have heard this thing again. Have you not said that I am pretty sure we should not? Oh, yes. If you choose to describe it as a coincidence, you might, well, you're might. you quite welcome. I'd rather that you do not call the thing names again. Doesn't mind? If you don't mind, it might be the poor little woman hears, and perhaps it hurts her. Don't you know? Ghost? No. Don't call anything a ghost. You can take in your hands and look at it ball low light. That rattles. When you shake it, do you know? But it's something that hears and understands. There's no doubt about that. I died sleeping in the best room room when I first came to the house, just because of the best, most comfortable. But I had to give it up. The room, there was a big bed she laid in. A cupboard is the thickness of the wall. The your head on the left, where it likes to be kept in its band box. I used to room for a fortnight when I came. I turned out and took a little room downstairs next to the surgery where Luke used to sleep when he respectively called the patient during the night. I was always a good sleeper, I sure for eight hours in my dose. Eleven or seven when I was alone. Twelve to eight was a friend with me. But I could not sleep uh, after three o'clock in the morning in that in my room. I called a pass to be cure accurate. In a matter of fact I timed it with my old pocket chronometer, which still keeps good time. It's always exactly seventeen minutes past three. I wonder whether that was the hour when she died. It's not what you heard. 
if it had been what they have not have stood it to night. It was not what you heard. If it had been what I could not have stood it two nights. It was just a start and a moan, a heavy and hard breathing for a few seconds in the cupboard. It never have been waking me under ornery circumstances. I'm sure I suppose you like me in that. We are not like other people. You've been to see no natural sounds disturb us at all. Not all the racket behind its spring square triggered hove and ivy girl, rolling the beam ends before the wind. If a lead pencil gets sets adrift and rattles in the drawer of your cabin, tell you, you will wake in a moment. Just so you always understand. Very well, the noise is in the cupboard. It was no louder than, than that. I wake me instantly. I said it was like a start. I know what I mean. But it's hard to explain without seeming to talk nonsense. Of course, you could not exactly hear a person start. And most you hear the quaint drawing breath below the parted lips of closed teeth. Almost impregnable sound of clo- clothing that suddenly m- moves suddenly, very slightly. It was like that. You know how one feels when a safe vehicle vessel is going to go do two or three seconds before it does? She does. Then one has a wheel. Riders say the way the same. Horse says, not strange, because the horse is a live animal with feelings of its own. The only poets and landsmen talk about ship being alive. And all that, I so always felt somehow that besides being a steaming machine or a cell machine for carrying weights of various sort of sea is a sense of instrument. A means of communication between nature and man. Most poets predict me man at will. If she's seen by hand, she takes her impressions directly from the wind and the sea, tide and stream, and transmits them to the man's hand. Just as why the telegraph picks up the interrupted currents aloft and turns them out below in the form of a message. You see what I'm driving at? First of something of I started at the cupboard. I felt it vividly and that, and that I heard of it. Didn't it? Well, you see when I was driving at what I'm driving at? I felt that something startled in the cupboard. I felt it so vividly that I heard it. Though you may not have been nothing to hear. A sound inside my head made me suddenly. But I only heard of a noise. It was, like it was muffled inside a box. So far away it came from a long distant telephone. Yet I knew it was inside the cupboard, near the head of my bed. My hair did not bristle. My blood did not cool and cold that time. I sent me with represent resented being wakened by something that had no business to make a noise any more than a pencil could rattle in a drawer of my cupboard table on board ship but I did not understand I just supposed that of a cupboard and more communication from the outside air that a wind had got in, in and was moaning through it with some sort of very strange screech I struck a light and looked at my watch it was 17 minutes past 3 I turned over and went to sleep over my right ear there's my good one. I'm. P- That's my good one. I'm pretty. Deaf of the other. If I struck the water with it, I was late in driving for the further still, top still yard. So anything to do, but the result is very convenient. I want to go to sleep when there's when there's a noise. For the first night, the same thing happened again, and several times afterwards. Well, not really, though it's always at the same time, a second, perhaps, is sometimes sleeping on my good ear. Sometimes not, I held the cupboard. And no way to which the wind could get in, no anything else. For the door itself a good fit, having meant to keep the uh, moths, I suppose. But in fact, must have kept the winter things in it. For it still smells of canafar and turpentine. After the fortnight, I had enough of the noises. As far as I said to myself, it would be silly to yield to it. I take the skeleton out of the room. All things always look different by daylight, don't they? But a voice that grew louder, I suppose. One may call it a voice. It got inside my deaf ear, too, one night. I sort of realised I was very noise wide awake. My good ear was jammed down on the pillow. I ought to have heard of... Not have heard of Foghorn. That position... But heard that I made me lose my temper, unless it, unless it scared me, for sometimes the two were not far apart. I struck a light to get up and opened the cupboard, grabbed a band box and threw it out the window as far as I could. When my hair stood on end, the thing had screamed in the air like a shell from a 12-inch gun. It fell on the other side of the road. The night was very dark. I could not see it fall, but I knew it fell beyond the road. The window was just over the front door. 
It is fifteen yards to the fence, more or less. The road is ten years wide. There's a quick hedge, set hedge beyond. Along the gobble it belongs to the vicarage. I do not see it much more than night. I'm not more than half an hour before I'd thrown the drain box out when I heard a shriek outside. Like that, like what I, we have tonight. But worse, more despairing. I could should call out, and may we may have been my imagination. But I would have sworn that screams came nearer and nearer each time. A little pipe we walked up and down a bit for a bit, and took a book, set up reading. I'll be hanged if I can remember what I read, nor even if the book was. For every now and then a shriek came up that would made a dead man turn his coffin. A little more before dawn, and someone knocked at the front door. There's no mistaking that was anything else. I opened my window and looked down, for I guessed that someone wanted a doctor. Supposing the new man had taken Luke's house, he was rather relieved to hear a human knock after that awful noise. You can see the door b- from above, owing to the little porch. The knocking came again. I called out, asking who was there, but nobody answered. For the knock was repeated, I rang, sang out again. Then said the doctor did not live here any longer. There was no answer. But it occurred to me it was, might have been an old countryman, a stone deaf. So I took my candle and went down to open the door. Upon my word, I was not thinking of the thing yet. I almost forgotten the other noises. I went down, convinced I should find somebody outside of the doorstep with a message. I set the candle on the half table so this wind would not blow out when it opened. When it opened. While I was drawing the old-fashioned bolt, I could see the knocking again. A lot louder and kind of quite queer, hollow sound. Now that I was close to it, I remember I suddenly thought it may be by some person wanted to get in. It wasn't. There was somebody else there. But I opened the door inward, standing a little on one side, to see it went went out at once. So he rolled across the threshold and stopped against my foot. I drew it back as I felt it, but I knew that it was before I looked down. I cannot tell you. I know I knew it seems unreasonable, but I am not quite sure. I have thrown it across the room. The French window opens wide. I got a good swing, flung it out. Besides, when I went out early in the morning, I found the bandbox beyond the thickest hedge. Set a hedge. You might think it opened when I tried it. The skull dropped out, but that's impossible. Well, nobody could throw an empty box so far. Out of the question, you might as well fling a ball or paper. 25 yards of blow, or blown bird's egg. To get her back... I shut and bolted the door, door, picked the thing up carefully, put it to a table beside the candle. I did that mechanically, as one instinctly does, the right thing in danger, without thinking at all, unless one does the opposite. It might seem odd, but I do believe my first thought would have been that somebody might come and find me there, a fresh old, while it was resting against my foot, lying, side on its, lying little on its side, turning one whole eye up at my face as it meant to accuse me. Then the light and shadow from the candle played in the hollows of the eyes as it stood on the candle table. So it seemed to open and shut at me. Then the candle went out quite expectedly. Through the door was fastened and there was not the least draught. I had oozed up at least half a dozen matches for you burn again. I sat down rather suddenly. Without knowing why, probably had been fairly frightened, perhaps you might admit, and no great shame being scared, the thing had come home, it wanted to go upstairs, back to its cupboard. It still, I sat still and stared for a bit, as it, for a bit, I, until I began to feel very cold. I took it and carried it up, I got it, set it in its place, I remember I spoke to it. I promised him to have its stand box, stand box again in the morning. You want to know whether I stayed in the room till daybreak? Yes, but I kept the burning burning. I sat up smoking, reading, most likely out of fright, plain and defiable fear. You need only not to call it cowardice either, for it's not the same thing. I would could not have stayed alone with that thing covered should I have been scared to death. 
Though I do not nor timid am other people, confound it all, man, if it had crossed the road alone and not got out the doorstep and not it to be let in. When the dawn came, I put on my boots and went out to find the sandbox. box. I had to go look at way round by the gate near the high road. I found the box open, hanging on the other side of the hedge. It caught on two twigs by a string and the lid had fallen off, and lying on the ground below it. That shows it had not, uh, not opened till it was well over. If it had not been opened as soon as it left my hand, it was inside, it must have been gone beyond the road too. There, yeah, it's all. I took the box since it's upstairs to the book cupboard. I put the skull back and locked it up. When the girl brought me my breakfast, she said she was sorry, but she must go. She's not skipped to care if they lost her wages, much wages. Looked her and her face was sort of greenish, yellow white. Pretended to be surprised and asked what the matter was. But there was no use, for she just turned to me and wanted to know whether I want, what it meant to stay in a haunted house. How long I expected to live if I did. Although she no, though for those notice, I sometimes a little hard of hearing. She did not believe that even I could not hear sleep for those sound screams again. And if I could, why had I been moving about the house and opening and shutting the front door for three and four in the morning? There's no answer in that. Since she heard me, off with you she went, and I was about left to myself. I went down the village during the morning and found a woman who was willing to come do a little work. Little work. There I went in and cooked my dinner, on condition she might go home every night. As for me, I moved downstairs that night day. I've never tried to sleep in that bed. Best bedroom since. After a little while, I had got a brace of middle aged Scotch servants from London, and things grew quiet enough for a long time. I began to tell them about the house as a very exposed position. We didn't whistle around its good deal, deal of the winter and winter. I was given his bad name in the village, the girl and his people inclined to superstition, telling ghost stories to two hard faced, sandy fed girl sisters. Almost smiled, they answered with great contempt, but they had no great opinion of any southern bogey, whatever, having been in service at two English haunted houses. They had never seen so much as a boy in grey, whom they reckoned no very particular rarity in the forfeiture. They stayed with me for several months. While they were in the house, we had peace and quiet. One of them was here and there again now, when she went away with her sister in a year. This one, she was a cook, married a sexton, who works in my garden. That's the way it is. There's a small village, she's not much to do. Oh, I knows enough about flowers to help me nicely without being doing most of the hard work, as though I'm, fu- I'm fond of exercise. I get a little stiff in the hinges. He's sober, son fellow, and means his, means his own business. He's a widower when I came here. Tohinan is his name, James Deering. Scott's sisters would not admit there's anything wrong about the house, but when the member came, they gave me a warning. They were going on the ground at the chapel. There's such a long walk from here. Being in the next parish, they could not possibly go to our church. The younger one came back in the spring as soon as the bams could be published. She was married to James Torini by the vicar. She seems to have no scruple about hearing him preach since then. I'm quite surprised she is. She is the couple living in a little in a small cottage that looks down over the graveyard. I suppose you're wondering what it is to do has to do with what I'm talking about. I suppose you're wondering what this has to do with what I'm talking about. I I alone so much when I owe my friends to see me. I sometimes go talking, just go on talking but for the sake of hearing my own voice. But in this case, that is really a connection of ideas. It was Jane Tohoney, a very poor Mrs. Pratt, and the husband of he, her, of her, in the same grave. It's not fair far from the back of his cottage. The connection in my mind, you see, is plain enough. He knows something. Quite sure that he does. My main manner, though he's so much recent, recent beggar. Yes, I'm alone in the house at night now. Mrs. Featherhead does something, does something, everything herself. I have a friend in the Saxon face. Comes, when I have a friend, the Saxon niece comes in to wait on the table. He takes his wife home every winter, every evening in the winter, but in summer when there is light, she goes by herself. She's not a nervous woman, but less sure she used to be there. No bogies in England, worth a Scotsman's notice. Woman's notice. Isn't it amusing the idea of Scotland have a monopoly of supernatural 
What sort of approach or pride? I call, call that, don't you? It's good there. It's a good fire, isn't it? The driftwood fire gets started. At least there's nothing like it, I think. Yes, we've got lots of it. I'm sorry to say, there's still a great many wrecks about here. I mean, it's a lonely close, and you must may have all the wood you want to trouble bring it in to Harry and I borrow a cart now and again, load it between here and the split. I hate the coal fire when I can't can get wood of any sort. A log company, even if it's only a piece of uh, brick beam, as timber sawn off the salt, it makes pretty sparks. See how they fly like Japanese hand fireworks. I put my word with an old friend, good fire and a pipe, but one forgets all about the thing. I say it's especially now the wind is moderated. It's low, though, a blow a skull for a morning. You think you would like to see the skull? I have no objection. There's no reason why you shouldn't have a look at it. You never saw a perfect one in your life except a two front teeth missing in the lower jaw. Oh, yes, I haven't told you about the jaw yet. Fun and I found it in the garden last spring. It was digging a pit for a new barrisket go bed. You know, you, may, you know we make this barrisket bed for six or eight feet deep here. Yes, yes, I've forgotten to tell you that. You're digging straight down just as digs a grave. You want a, a good barrisket bed made. I advise you to make, get a section to make it for you. The fellows have a wonderful knack at the sort of digging. Father Hand got down to three feet when he cut in a mass of white lime and stretched inside the trench. He noticed that the earth was a little looser there. He says it had been not disturbed by a number of years, I suppose, he thought. The old lime might be not good for asparagus. So he broke it out and threw it out. It was pretty hard, he says, at the biggest bumps. Out of the sheer force of habit, he cracked the slumps of his spade. They outside the pit beside him. A job of a skull dropped out one of the pieces. He thinks he must have knocked out of two front teeth in breaking up the lime. But he did not, sh- did not see him anywhere. A very experienced man in such things as you may never imagine. I said it once, the jaw had probably belonged to a young woman. Her teeth had become complete when she died. He brought it to me and asked me if I wanted to keep it. If I did not, he said he would drop it into the next grave he made at Oak Churchyard. I suppose it was to Christina's jaw. I ought to have to see some burial. Where the rest of the body might be, I told him the doctor we we'll put bones in quick line to whiten them nicely. And what well, I suppose, Dr. Pratt, had once been a little lime pit in the garden for this purpose. I suppose I'd have forgotten a jaw, for the hen looked at me quietly. Maybe it fitted a skull. It used to be the co- cupboard upstairs, sir. He said, maybe Mr. Dr. Pratt had put the skull in the lime to clean it, or something. When he took it, he left the door jaw behind. There's some human hair sticking in the lime, sir. I saw there was, and there, that was that. What Turin did. He did not suspect anything. Why in the world should he have suspected the jaw might fit the skull? Besides, it did. A proof he knows well than he cares to tell. Do you suppose he looked before she, bur- she was buried? Before she was buried? Well, perhaps when he buried Luke in St. Garden. Well, there's no use to go go over that, is it? I said I'll keep the jaw with the skull, and I took it upstairs and fitted it into its place. There's not the slightest doubt. The two belong together, and together they are. Terrain knows several things. I was talking about plastering the kitchen a little while ago. He happened to remember he had not been done since the very week when Mrs. Pratt died. He did not say the mansion must have left some lime in the place, but he thought it. It was the very same lime he found in the asparagus pit. He knows a lot, Turin. In one of those silent beggars, you might put two and two together. That grave is very near the back of his cottage, too. And one of the quickest men in the spade I ever saw. If I wanted to know the truth, he could. And no one else would ever know be the wiser, unless he chose to tell him. Tell. A quiet village like ours, people don't go, spend the night in the churchyard, you see, with sex and potters about by himself before, between ten o'clock and daylight. That's all we'll think of De- Lake's deliberation. If he did it, his cool certainty, no one would find him out. Above all, his nerve uh, must have been extraordinary. I sometimes think it bad enough to live in the place where we've done. It really was done. I would put put in a condition, you see, for the sake of his memory, a little bit of my own sake too. I go out and search the box in a minute. Let me go light my pipe. There's no hurry. We have early supper.
supper, he had supper early. Only half of past nine o'clock. I never let a friend go to bed before twelve, or less than three glasses. You may have as many more as you like, but you shan't have less for the sake of old times. Breezing up again, do you hear? There's a little lull just now. We're having, we're going to have a bad night. A thing happened, made me start a little. I found the jaw fitted exactly. It was very easily startled. It was myself. I've been, pe- I've seen people make a quick movement, drawing their breath sharply. When they had fault, they were alone, started, turned. I saw no one ever near them. Nobody called that. Fi- nobody called that fear. They, you wouldn't, would you? No, just when you, I saw the jaw in its place on the skull, teeth closed shortly on my finger. I felt exactly as I've been biting me hard. I confess I jumped up before I realised I'd been pressing the jaw and the skull together by the other hand. I assure you, I was not at all nervous. But all night, night too, a fine day, the sun was streaming into the best bedroom. It might well have been absurd to be nervous. It was only a quick mistake of impression, but it really made me feel quite, feel queer. Somehow it might made me think of the funny verdict of the coroner's jury of Luke's death. By the hand or teeth of some person or an animal unknown. Ever since I wish I'd seen his marks his throat. No, the lower jaw was missing then. I often have seen a man do man same things with hands. He does not realise it at all. I saw one of man hanging on by his own oaring, stop with one hand leaning outward onward, outward with weight on it. He was just cutting and stopping with a knife on his other hand. I got my arms and around him. We were in mid-ocean, about doing twenty knots. He had the smallest idea he was not doing. Neither had I, but I managed to pinch my finger between the teeth of that thing. I could feel it now, exactly as if it were alive and trying to bite me. I would if I could, for I know it hates me, poor thing. Do you suppose what the rattles... The, the, about inside, you really bit of lead. Well, I get the box down presently, and whatever it happens to drop out into your hands, well, it's, that's your affair. If it's any cut of earth or pebble, the whole matter would be in my, my mind. I don't believe I should ever think of skull again. But I somehow, I cannot bring myself to shake out the bit of pulse stuff in myself. Mere do I idea, maybe lead, makes me confoundly uncomfortable. If I've got the conviction, I should know before long. I will certainly know. I'm sure I turn him a nose, but he's such a silent bugger. Bigger. I go upstairs and get it. What? You had better go with me? Ha ha! Do you think I'm afraid of a bandbox and noise? Nonsense. Bother the candle. I won't light. As if the ridiculous thing understood what it wanted for. Look at that. The third match. The light, the light fast enough for me pipe. There, do you see it? They light fast enough for my pipe. There, do you see it? Fresh box, just one and a tin f- safe. I kept the supply of countable dampness. Oh, you think the wicker candle may be damp, do you? All right, I'll light the beastly thing in the fire. Won't go out of all rents. It splutters a bit, but it will keep the light now. Burns just like all the other candles, won't it? In fact, that candles are not good enough. Very good about here. I don't know where they come from, but they weigh a burning low occasionally with a greenish flame that spits tiny sparks. I often annoyed by they're going out of themselves. I can't be helped, for it would be long before we have electricity in our village. It can really be poor. It, it, it really is poor light, isn't it? You think I'd better give... You leave you the candle and take the lamp, do you? I don't like to carry lamps, that's the truth. Never drop one in my life. But I've always thought I might. So confoundly dangerous, you see, so if you do. Besides, I'm pretty well used to have rotten candles by this time. You yeah, well, I as well finish the glass while well, I'm getting it. Oh, don't mean to let you go off for less than three before you go to bed. You may have to go upstairs either. I'll put you in the old study next to the surgery. That's where I live myself. The fact is, I never ask a friend to sleep upstairs now. last man I did was Crack and Fulp. He said he was kept awake all night. You remember old Crack? Don't you? He struck to the service. They made him an animal. Oh, yes, I'm off now. Unless the candle goes out, 
I can't, I, might, I can't help asking if you remember Crickerthorpe. If, it, if anyone who told us that skinny little idiot used to be was to turn out the most successful a lot of us, we should have laughed at the idea, shouldn't we? You and I do not value it, it's true, but I'm really going now. I don't mean to let you think that I'm putting it off by talking. If there's anything to be afraid of, I'm scared. I should tell you, quite frankly, get you, go up and let, get you to go upstairs with me. Here's a box. I brought it down carefully. That's not to disturb it, poor thing. You see, if it was shaking, the jaw might get separated from it again. I'm not sure he wouldn't like that. Yes, a candle went out as I was coming down. Stairs. That was a draught from the leaky window on the landing. Did you hear something, you think? Yes, there was another scream. Am I pale, do you say? That's nothing. My heart is quite queer sometimes. I went upstairs too fast, in fact. It wasn't a reason why I still prefer to live together on the ground floor. Whatever the shriek came from, it's not from the skull. For I had this box in my hands when I heard the noise. Here it is now. So he approved differently the screams were produced by something else. Oh no, I shall find out some day or make some some crevice of the wall, of course, or a crack in the chimney, or a chink in the frame of a window. That's the way all ghost stories end in real life, do you not? Do you know? I'm glad I'm totally glad I thought of going up and bringing it down for you to see. The last freak settles it to the question. To think that I should have been so weak to fancy the poor skull could really cry out like a living thing. Now I open a box and we take it out to look at it under the bright light. It's rather awful to think the poor lady used to sit there in your chair evening after evening, just after the same light, isn't it? But then I made up my mind that it's all rubbish from beginning to end. Just an old skull that Luke had been, when he was a student, perhaps he put it in a line merely to whiten it and not and could not find the jaw. I made a seal with a string, you see. I have put the jaw in its place and wrote on the cover. There's an old white label on it. Still, for the mother's address to Mrs. Pratt, a hat was sent to her. It, 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 there, in the room, I wrote on the edge, a skull once a property late loop product track MD. I don't know why I wrote that, unless it was the idea explaining how the thing happened to be in my possession. I cannot help wondering sometimes what sort of hat was a saint came in the bird box. What colour was it? Do you think? Is a grey, a sparring hat, a bobbing feather, a pretty ribbons? Strange that saying the same box should hold a bed, a wall of finery, perhaps. No, he made in our minds. It just came from the hospital in London, where Luke did his time. It's far better to look at it in the light, isn't it? There's no more connection between the skull and poor Mr. Pratt, and there will be between my story and the lead, and the... Good Lord! Take the lamp. Don't let it go out. If you can help it. I have the window fastened. Again in a second. I say, what's the, what's the gale? There, it's out. I told you. So, never mind. There's a firelight. I've got the window shut. The bolt's only halfway down. What's the box blown, on, what's the box blown off the table? Where the juice is it? There. That won't open again. If I put it down, and up, put it on the, but the bar. Good dodge, an old-fashioned bar. There's nothing like it. Now you find the band box while well, I light the lamp. Confounded the wretches for wretches. Yes, a pipe fill is built better. I must light in the, f- in the fire. I must have a thought of it. Thank you. But there we are. There, there we are again. Where's the box? Yes. Put the box back on the table. We'll open it. It is the first time I've known a window burst of windows open. A pretty careless of my part, but I just, I just shut it. Yes, of course I heard the scream. See to go around the house before I broke in at the window. It proves there's always been the wind. Nothing else, doesn't it? Well, it's not the wind. It's my imagination. I've always been a very imaginative man. Always, I must have been. No, I wouldn't. Did I know it? You grow older and we understood ourselves better. Don't you know? I have to drop at Hanverford's neat. By end of expectation, since you are filling your, your glass... A damp just chilled me with my rheumatic tendency. I'm very much afraid of a chill. But the cold sometimes seems to stick in my joints all winter. And when it gets when it gets in Boy George, that's good stuff. Just light a fresh pipe. Now there's everything snug again. 
and we just opened the box. I'm so glad we heard the last scream together. A skull here and a table between us. The thing cannot possibly be two places at the same place. A noise most suddenly came from the outside. A noise the wind must takes must. You thought you heard it scream through the gnome. Over the window was burst open. Oh yes, did I? So I did. That was natural enough. When something things open, of course we heard the wind. What could you one expect? Look here, please. I want you to see the seal is intact before we open the box together. Will you take my glasses? No, you have your own. All right. The seal is sound. You see? You agree the words on the motto easily. Sweet and low. That is because the poem goes on. Will end of the winter's fist and sea. It says, blow him again to me, and all that. Here is a real seal, my stretched train, where it's hung for more than forty years. My poor little wife gave it to me when I was courting. I never had any, any other. It's just like her to think of those words. You're always fond of Tennyson. You know no way to cut the string, for it's fastened to the box. So I had just to break the wax and untie the knot. I must have seal it up again. You see, I like to feel the thing is safe in its place, and nobody can take it out. Not that I should suspect a hand of meddling with it. But I always feel that it knows a little a lot more about the details. You see, I managed it without breaking the string, though. No. I fastened it, and I never expected to open the handbox again. There comes a easy enough. There, now look. What? Nothing in it? Empty? It's gone, man. The skull is gone. No, there's nothing the matter with me. I'm only trying to collect my thoughts. It's so strange, I'm possibly certain. It was inside when I put the seal last spring. I haven't imagined that. It's utterly impossible. Never give a stiff glass of a friend now and then. I must admit, I might have made a, some mythic mistake when I've taken too much. Don't I never, but I don't. I never did. I had a pint of ale with supper and half to go to rum. It's bedtime, the most I ever took in my good days. I believe it's always a f- me, sober fellows, who get rheumatism and gout. Yet you my real seal, you know, there is an empty rent fan box, the plain enough. I say, I don't half like this. It's not right, you have something wrong about it, in your opinion. You don't talk to me about supernatural manufactures, I don't believe in them. For a little bit, sometimes he must have tampered with the steel and broke, stolen the skull. Sometimes when I go to work in the boy garden in the summer, I leave my watch and chain on the table. Tunnahan must have taken the seal and then, and used it. He would have been quite sure that he would, could come in for last an hour. If he's not, Tunnahan, I don't talk to me about the possibility that the thing has got in by himself. If it has, I must be somewhere about the house, somewhere out the way corner waiting. We'll come upon it again, waiting for us. Don't you know? Just wait in the dark. Then it'll scream at me. It'll shriek at me in the dark. For it hates me, I tell you. The bad boxes are quite empty. We're not dreaming either of us. There, I turn it upside down. What's that? Something fell out of it as I hand turned it over? It's on the floor. It's near your feet. I know. It is, and we must find it. Help me to find it, man. Have you got it? For God's sake, give it to me, quickly. Lead. I knew it when I have heard it fell. I knew it couldn't be anything else but a little flood it made by the heath and rug. So that it's lead after all, and Luke did it. I hear I felt a little sh- bit shaken up. Not exactly nervous, you know, but badly shaken up, that's a fact. Anyway, would I should think, after all, you cannot say fear the thing. If I went up and brought it down, at least believed I was bringing it down. That's the same thing by George, rather than give it to such nonsense. I take the box upstairs again and put it in the back of its place. I'm not... It's not that. It's certainly the poor little woman came in the end to that way. My fault because I told a story. That's what it is so dreadful, however, somehow. I always hoped I should never be quite sure of it. There's no doubting it now. That's that. Look at that. Look at this. Look at it. Little lump of lead in a peculiar shape. Think of what it did, man. Doesn't it make you shiver? He gave you something to make her sleep. Of course. It must have been one moment of agony, awful agony. Think of the bowling, having bowling lead poured into your brain. Think of it, she was dead before she could scream. No, but only think of it. 
think of it. Oh, there it is again, just outside. I know, it's just outside. I can't keep it out of my head. Oh, oh! You thought I had fainted. No, I wish I had. You thought it would have stopped sooner. It well, to, very well to say that it's only a noise. A noise never hurts anybody. You're right as a shroud yourself. The only one thing to be done is hope, if we hope to close an eye might tonight, you might find to put it back in his bandbox and shut it up in the cupboard where it likes to be. I don't know how it got out, but it wants to get back, get in again. That's why it screams so awfully tonight. I never so bad as this, never since I first bury it. Yes, if I find it, we'll bury it if it takes us all night. We bury it six feet and ram down the earth over it. It shall never get out again. And if it screams, we suddenly shall suddenly hear it down, so deep down outside. We get the lantern and look for it. We cannot be far away. I'm sure it's got outside. It's coming in when I shut the window. I don't know it. Yes, you're quite right. I'm losing my senses. I've just got myself to told my hold of myself. Don't speak to me for a minute or two. I'll sit quite still and keep my eyes shut and repeat something I know. That's the best way. Add together the altitude and latitude and pull below the distance. Divided by two, set the altitude from the south sum. Then add a logarithm to the skint of the latitude, the constant of the whole polar distance. Constantine half sum, the sheen of the half sum minus the altitude. There. Don't say that I'm out of my senses. My memory is all right, isn't it? Of course. You may say that is mechanical. We never forget the things we learned when we were boys. We use us almost every day for a lifetime. That's the very point. When a man's going crazy, his back to the local point of his mind gets out of order. It doesn't work right. He remembers things that never happened. He sees things that weren't real. He hears voices, not noises, but it's perfectly silent. That's not what the matter with either us, is it? Come, we'll get the lantern and go around the house. It's not raining. Only blowing like old boats. Boots, we used to say. The lantern is in the cupboard under the stairs in the hall. I've always kept it trimmed in the case of the wreck. No use to look at a thing. I don't know how you say that. I would bury it. No sense to take, talk of burying it. Of course, but it doesn't want to be buried. It wants to go back in the bandbox and be taken upstairs, poor thing. Turin took it out, I know, and made the seal over again. Perhaps he took it to the grave churchyard. He went well. I mean, he went well. I just say he thought he would never not scream any more if he if he quietly laid the contrary ground near where it belongs. But he had it, it, it has come home. Yes, it, that's it. He's not as half a bad fellow to him. A rather religiously inclined, I think. Does not sound natural and reasonable. Well meant. He suppose it screamed because it's not decently buried with the rest. But he's wrong. I see you know that it screams to me because it hates me, because of any of my fault. A little lump of lead in it. No use to look for it, anyhow. Nonsense, I tell you. It wants to be found. Hark. What's that knocking? Do you hear it? Knock, knock, knock. Three times. Pause and then again. It's a hollow sound, hasn't it? So it was home, gone home. I heard a knock before. It wants to come in and be taken upstairs in its box. It's at the front door. Will you come with me? But take it in. Yes, I own that. I don't like to go alone. I open the door. A thing will roll in and stop and start against my foot, just as it did before, and the light will go out. I'm a good deal shaken by finding a bit of lead, as perhaps my heart wasn't quite right. Too, too much strong tobacco, perhaps. Besides, I'm quite willing to own that I'm a bit nervous tonight. I never was before in my life. That's right. Come along. I'll take the box with me, so you not not to come back. Do you hear that knocking? Not like the other knocking I ever heard. If you will, for open, hold this door open. I'll hold for the lantern under the stairs by the light from his room without bringing the lamp into the hall. It won't go. Uh, uh, it only would only go out. Other things we know, 
the other thing knows the thing knows we're coming. Hark, it's patient to get in. Don't shut the door till the lantern is already. Whatever you'll do, there'll no, there'll be no more usual trouble the matches, I suppose. No, the first time by Jove I tell you wants to get in. There's no trouble. All right, the that with the door now. Shut it please. Now come and turn on the lantern. We're blowing so hard outside I shall have to use both hands. That's it. Hold the light now, low. Do you hear the knocking still? Here it goes. Open just enough for my foot against the bottom of the door. Now. Catch it. Only the wind that blows across the floor. That's all. There's half a hurricane outside. I tell you, have you got it? The band box is on the table. One minute. I have it. I have the bar up. There. Why did you throw it in the box so roughly? Doesn't like that, you know. What did you say? Bend your hand. Nonsense, man. You did not... You just... You did just what I did. You press your jaw, the jaws together, your hand, and pinch it yourself. Let me see. You don't, you don't mean to say you have been drawn blood? You have been well, squeezed hard, said by Jove. The skin is certainly torn. I'll give you some bucolic solution. Remember, before we go to bed. For I, I say, they say scratch from a skull's tooth may go bad and give trouble. Come on inside again, and let me... See it by the lamp. I bring the brown box. And never mind the lantern. It may be as soon as well burnt in the hall. But I shall need it presently when I go up the stairs. Yes, yeah, shut the door if you will. It takes more cheerful, looks more cheerful and bright if your finger's still bleeding. Is your finger still bleeding? I'll get you the carbolic in an instant. Let me see the thing. Ah, uh, there's a drop of blood in the upper jaw. Isn't on the eye tooth? Ghastly, isn't it? I saw it running along the floor of the floor hall. Its strength almost went up out of my hands I felt my knees bending and I understood what well, it was a girl driving in, in, over the smooth boards don't blame me no I should think not we are boys together we've been seen a thing or two we may just as well own to each other we are both in beastly funk when it slid across the floor at you no wonder you pinched your finger picked it up pick, finger picking it up oh that if I did the same thing as sheer nervousness in broad daylight, with the sun streaming in on me. Strange that door would stick to it closely, isn't it? I suppose the dampness, for it shuts like a vice. I wiped off the do- blood, uh, blood, for it is not nice to look at. I'm going to open, I'm not going, I'm not going to open the doors. Don't be afraid, I shall not play any tricks, the poor thing. But I steal the box again, and we'll take it upstairs and put it away where it wants to be. Wax and the writing the table on the window. Thank you. It will not long before I leave my seal lying. Bad again. Not but for to hand to use, I'll tell you. It's plain I don't explain natural for another. If you choose to think that her hand had hidden it somewhere in the bushes, the girl blew it in the house against the door, made it knock if you wanted to let it in. Not thinking them possible. I am quite ready to agree with you. Do you see that? You swear you actually see me seal this time in case anything of this kind should occur again. A wax fast as a string to the lid cannot possibly be lifted, even the, through though to get one finger. You are quite satisfied I do. Yes, besides, I shall lock the cupboard and keep the key in my pocket hereafter. Now we'll take the lantern and go upstairs. Do you know? You're very much inclined to agree, your theory. The wind blew it against the house. I'll go ahead. For no, the stairs. Just hold the lantern near my feet. Go up. Now the wind howls and whistles. Did you feel the sand on the door? Under your shoes as we crossed the hall? Yes, this is the door, the best bedroom. Hold the lantern, please. This side by the head of the bed. I felt the cupboard open. I left the cupboard open when I got the box. Isn't it queer? A faint odour of woman's dresses will still hang, ab- will hang about or cross it for years. This is a shelf. You see me put a box here. There, yeah, now see me turn the key and put it in my pocket. So that's done. Good night. Are you quite comfortable? Not much of room, but I dare say you should as soon as sleep here. It's upstairs tonight. If you want something, sing out. There's only a lathe and a partition, partition between us. There's not much wind on this side by half. There's Holland's on the table. If you have one, have one more. Right. There's Holland's on the table. If you will have one more nightclub. No, well, do as you please. Good night again. And don't dream about the same thing if you can. 
following paragraph appeared in the Panorama News, 23rd of November, 1906. Mysterious death of a retired sea captain. The village of Francoon is most disturbed by a strange death of Captain James Bullock. No sorts of impossible stories are so incriminating regards to circumstances which certainly seem difficult with his explanation. Tire Captain, who sincerely commanded in his time the largest, fastest liners, belonging to one of the principal transatlantic steamships companies, was found in his bed on Tuesday morning in his own cottage, quarter mile from the village, an examination made at once the local practitioner. Which revealed the humourable fact that the seas had been bitten in the throat by a human assailant with such amazing force as to crush the windpipe and cause death. A mark of the teeth bore on both jaws was so plainly visible on the skin it could be counted. But the variety of the deed of the eventually lost the two middle insiders. It is hoped that this peculiarity may help to vent the murder. It could only be a dangerous escape maniac. As he ceased, though only sixty years old of age, it's set over a higher man of considerable physical strength. Remarkable, no signs of any struggle were visible. Room, nor could it be asserted how the murderer had entered the house. Warning had been sent to all insane asylums in the United Kingdom. Not yet, no information had been received regarding the escape of any dangerous patient. Coroner Drury returned that of some what well, single verdict that Captain Buddock came to his death by the hands or teeth of some person unknown. Local surgeons said to have expressed Privately, the opinion of the maniac is a woman, a view he deduces from the small size of the jaws, has thrown at the marks of the teeth. The whole affair is shrouded in a mystery. Captain Buddock was a widower and lived alone. He leaves no children. Note, students of the ghost law and haunted houses will find a foundation of folk going so in the legends. The skull is preserved in a farmhouse called Bedestow Manor, situated, I believe, on the Dorset coast.